continues on in that thought and he lets us know here there's some things that we do when we're suffering. We look at verse 12. He said, Beloved, first of all, he tells us, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. So what Peter said here is that we should not think it to be strange when we face these trials, when fiery trials even come upon us. In other words, he said, when they come, uh, there should be no surprise in us whatsoever because we know that all that live godly are going to suffer persecution. Uh, there, there's peaks and valleys no matter if you're a child of God or not. How many had bad days when you were in the world? Amen. My best day as a Christian, my worst day as a Christian does not even compare. It doesn't even compare to what we faced back then. So I'm thankful for His grace. In other words, what He is telling us, don't be surprised. There's a truth that what happens, though, when we begin to suffer, when we begin to go through trials, the truth is we do act surprised, don't we? We begin, we begin to look at the things that we're going through and, and we begin to complain about what we're going through when these trials and these tests come. And, uh, and Peter's telling us not to be surprised. Don't think it's strange. Uh, but we do. Uh, we do begin to complain about our situation and our circumstance. Uh, and it seems like we're surprised that we have to face it. Uh, but Peter tells us here that our response uh, should not be that of complaining. Uh, but Peter tells us something uh, uh, of vastly different from complaining and what does he tell us here uh, when we face these trials uh, that we go through something that is far from our mind when we go through trials and testings Peter says but rejoice has this guy lost his mind? We may be thinking, uh, rejoice when I face a trial. Uh, rejoice when I'm suffering. Uh, rejoice when things don't go my way. Uh, when things don't go our way, uh, we start as a toddler. We begin to stomp, right? Begin to pout. And begin to uh, wonder why things are not going our way. I saw a video the other day that a toddler tried that with his mom uh, and began to uh, reach for something in the grocery store. Uh, and the mom told him, no, put it back. And that toddler went to pout. But when that toddler went to do it, uh, mom fell on the floor and began to kick and scream and pout and holler. That toddler stood back in utter surprise. Uh, but we act that way sometimes uh, when we don't get our way, uh, when things don't go the way that we think they do. But Peter said, don't do that. Uh, if that's how you handle trials uh, and persecutions and struggle in 2019, uh, leave that behind you. Uh, you've got a new year. You've got a new decade. Uh, you've got a new opportunity to say, I have a new approach when suffering comes. Uh, i got a new approach uh, when things don't go my way. Uh, I'm not going to pick up the phone and complain to somebody. I'm not going to begin to uh, begin to come and say, can you believe this happened? Uh, but Peter challenges us here, uh, but rejoice. Sister Amy is ready to rejoice, but she's the only one. But rejoice in so much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy so here we are when they come these trials come don't be surprised but we should be ready we should be ready they're coming and not only ready but we should rejoice in the trial this man kind of lost his mind but now many people, we have a problem with suffering. I get that. Uh, we wonder why God allows people who love Him. Uh, have you ever asked God this, Lord, I love you and I serve you and I've done all this stuff right in your eyes. Uh, and maybe even the situation, you did the right thing, uh, but yet you're suffering for it. We don't get that. Uh, we don't get, Lord, I'm doing the right thing. Uh, but Peter gives us the answer to that question. First of all, uh, he tells us that persecution uh, measures how strong our faith is our faith is in God not man and, and understand this before I get to the points that Peter is making here uh, I want to make sure that we get this point uh, when you've done something right when you've stood for the word of God uh, when you've stood for what is right when you've done uh, the right thing uh, and you're suffering uh, think about uh, the ones that's causing that suffering uh, it's usually ones that are not living according to the word of God uh, it's usually from those uh, that are not wanting the will of God in their lives uh, they don't 
don't understand the will of God, don't seek after the will of God, uh, their soul has not been restored. Uh, your soul has been restored and you're trying to do what is right in God's eyes. Uh, so they're going to persecute you. Uh, and then we try to put that back on God. And we say, God, I've did everything right. I, I, I've did all the right things. I've stood. I, I've stood on the, the, the solid ground. I, I did not move. I did not give in. I, I held to my convictions. I held to my standard. I, and now I'm suffering because of it. I, and you know what the Lord's going to do when you tell Him that? Perfect. That's exactly where I want you to be in. Because uh, man uh, is not going to applaud when you do what is right in the sight of God. Uh, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, uh, he said, who do men say that I am? And they gave all of these answers of prophets and Elijah and Jeremiah and Isaiah. And he said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter's the one that penned. These words that we're preaching out of the night. But he said that. And you know what Jesus said back to him? He said, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. Flesh and blood does not reveal spiritual things. He said, but my Father which is in heaven. So don't look for the applause of flesh and blood. Look for flesh and blood to cause you to suffer because you said, He is the Christ. He is my God. He is my rock. He is my salvation. God's first and everything else is second. His will takes precedence over everything else. It might not be popular with family. It might not be popular with friends. But I know what God told me to do. I know how God told me to walk. I know what God told me to say. I know where God told me to go. I know God's perfect will for my life. Because you've been in the prayer closet. They have not. Remember that. When you begin to suffer at the hands of evildoers, they got that name for a reason. Because they're opposed to the things of God. You're not opposed to the things of God. You want to do the will of God. And that's going to cause an onslaught of the enemy. If you don't want to suffer, I'm going to tell you what to do tonight. You don't want any problems, any suffering, any opposition in your spiritual life. Here's what you do. Absolutely nothing. If you do absolutely nothing, you won't have to worry about it. Just float downstream like any dead fish. And say, K.L. Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. I don't need God. I don't need the church. I don't need anything. Uh, I, I just want everybody to love me and everybody to like me. So I'm going to do what they want me to do. You'll be all right then, right? No, because the end of that is hell. I, I posted something a few years on Facebook and it came up in my memories today and said, I, I doubt that there'll ever be a decrease in the wages of sin. There'll never be a decrease in the wages of sin. The wages of sin will always be death. So back to what Peter had to say. Persecution measures how strong our faith is. Uh, notice here these words, uh, which is to try you uh, or to test you. Uh, persecution will tell you how strong you are, how weak you are. Uh, your faith uh, is under testing. Uh, and so here's a person uh, that has this faith, uh, and their faith can be measured by how much he's willing to sacrifice for it uh, or how much he's willing to suffer for it. Uh, it's one thing to say, I'm a man or a woman of faith. It's one thing to say, I, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God. It, it, it's one thing uh, to say, I'm willing to sacrifice, uh, I'm willing to give all. Uh, but when the rubber meets the road is when we're tested uh, or when we're tried. Uh, we can tell how strong our faith is uh, by how much we're willing to sacrifice uh, for the cause of Christ. Man, we say that we're ready to sacrifice for the cause of Christ. We've heard stories uh, of people that's looked down the gun barrel uh, and asked that question, do you believe in Christ? They knew their life was on the line. Uh, and they said, yes, I believe in Christ. Uh, cost them their life. Uh, there's many of us uh, that we can't be on the end of a gun barrel. Uh, it wouldn't take that much. We're not even willing to, to give that much. Uh, some say, one said this way, uh, don't say you're willing to die for the cause of Christ uh, when you're not even willing to 
lift your hands and worship Him uh, in a worship service uh, or even step into His house. Uh, but we got to realize uh, that there is a testing uh, and a sacrifice that comes with being a child of God. Uh, and it tells how strong we are. For some, we're willing to make any sacrifice necessary. But for others, we're not willing to make any sacrifices at all. There's some indicators. There's some indicators, some testing points that you have to place in your life. I'm not talking to who is not here. I'm talking to who is here. And I guess we're on Spreaker, so whoever tunes in on there, I guess I'll be talking to them as well. But these are some indicators that we can, some gauges. How many wants to know how strong your faith is? We're going to have a test. Are you a tither and a giver? If so, then you're willing to sacrifice for God and trust Him. You're willing to say that 10% comes right off the top. It belongs to God, uh, God first. Uh, and you're willing to make that sacrifice. Uh, when you're a tither and a giver, you're not going to say, uh, well, let me pay all of my bills, get all of my groceries, uh, take care of all my gas money, uh, and then if I have 10% left, I'll put it in there. Uh, if not, I'll give God 2%, 3%. Tithe means 10%. Uh, and tithes is the first fruit of all of your increase. Uh, so if you're that one, uh, that when that check comes in or when it hits the bank, uh, you know right off the top 10% of that's not even for me to think about or consider that belongs to God and then you go above and beyond that and bring your tithes and your offerings into the storehouse that means that you're willing to sacrifice that you're willing to say I'm willing to know that if I give God 10% 90% is going to go a whole lot further than 100% If you can check that box off, uh, you're well on your way uh, to being strong in your faith. Uh, Number two, are you faithful to every service at God's house? Uh, If so, then you're willing uh, to make the sacrifice necessary uh, to make sure you're in church. Uh, Then if not, then most of the time it means you have weak faith. Now, that's not... Sometimes we throw that out there and the ones that it's not supposed to hit is the ones that it hits. And, and that's the ones that I find that's faithful. I, I've preached about church attendance, and I've had some people reach out to me and say, Oh, Brother Jamie, I want to be in church, but I, I, I just can't because of this. That God knows that situation. God knows that heart. I, it's that one says, I, I know I could be in church tonight, but I'm just not going. I know I could be there, but I'm just, I, I've got other things that I want to do. Uh, that's what he's talking about there. Uh, but when church is priority to you, uh, then you're well on your way to being strong in your faith. Uh, are you reaching others for God? Statistics say, I started reading Brother Hank's devotional book. January finally got here, so I started reading it. And I believe it was day three or day four that he gave these statistics. And I believe those statistics, if I'm not mistaken, was 80-something percent, may have been 90-something percent of Christians have never shared their faith. Never witnessed to anyone else. Never told them about God. Are we reaching others for God? If we are, then we're making the sacrifice necessary to accomplish that task. If not, our faith is probably weak. Number four, are you willing to suffer for Jesus' sake? I'm not talking about being a missionary to Hawaii. I'm talking about suffering for Jesus' sake. Doing whatever it takes to say, God, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, and mean it, and mean it, then your faith is strong, very strong. And you know what? You know how strong your faith is, and if it's strong, you're going to need it to be strong because persecution is going to come. Number two, persecution proves our trust in God. Uh, Our persecution teaches us to depend on God more and more. One of two things will happen when you suffer. Our sufferings will either draw us closer to God or our sufferings will push us away from God. Which one should they do? draw us closer to God and if they do that we'll learn to depend upon him more and more and we'll learn to trust him more and more so if we could get that point when we're suffering to realize when I'm suffering it's drawing me closer to God to be like Jesus we sing with a smile on our face that's all I ask 
is to be like him. And the father says, oh, really? Oh, really? To be like Jesus? Do you realize what Jesus went through in the flesh? Do you realize what Jesus went through in his 33 and a half years here on planet earth? He suffered. He was ridiculed. He went to his own and his own received him not. He said the son of man does not even have a place to lay his head. They, want, they wanted to, to, to be at his side. And he said, you ready? He said, foxes have holes. I don't even have a place to, to lay my head. And he went to that cruel cross. Listen, are we willing to go all the way? If we realize that our going all the way will do the same thing that it did for Jesus. Because if you're looking for Jesus, you won't find him. Here the angel said, he's not here. He is risen. I'm looking for the day that somebody comes by. Middleburg Church of God said, I'm looking for Pastor Jamie uh, that you can look at him uh, and say, He's not here. Uh, he is risen. Uh, he's gone. Uh, where what do you mean gone? Uh, he's in the presence uh, of the Father. That's what I'm longing for. Uh, that's what I'm yearning for. Uh, and for your sake, if you're the one giving the answer for that, uh, I hope I went by the way of the grave and not the rapture. Amen. I- I'm looking for that day when others can say that. So I want to be drawn closer to God. And if we do, we'll learn to depend upon Him more. Number three, persecution strengthens our patience. One man said, don't pray for patience. But we have to have patience. And endurance. I've known people that's very strong, don't have a lot of endurance. There's some folks that seem to be strong, but they can't endure a whole lot. I want to not just be strong in my faith, but I want to be one that is enduring and have much endurance in this walk of life. When we're persecuted and we endure it, it makes us stronger. He said, endure it like a good soldier and face it, making us even stronger than what we was before. And when we have more patience and endurance, uh, we're going to face another battle. And then we're going to find that that upcoming battle, that we're ready for it because we've made it through with patience and endurance. Number four, persecution proves our faith and attracts others to Jesus. Understand something. Others are watching you when you're struggling. Others are watching you when you're going through the test. When you stood for what is right. They may be the very ones that's giving you a hard time, but they're watching to see how you're going to respond. There's some people that push your buttons on purpose because they're trying to find out what this faith that you're talking about is really all about. They're wanting to see. Sometimes they're a pawn in the hand of the enemy, but sometimes uh, it's conviction, uh, and, and, and they've chose not to be vessels under righteousness, but so God uh, begins to touch and move in their hearts, and they begin to get a curiosity, uh, and, and who knows, God could be dealing with them, uh, and you're the Christian that they know. They don't know this God. They don't know this Bible. They don't know this church, but they know you, and you're a Christian So they begin to test you out. They begin to put you through some stuff. You know why they do it? They're going to see how you're going to respond. They want to see if you respond any different than they would respond. They want to see if your reaction is going to be any different than what their reaction would be. And that when we should be uh, 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 putting up our fist and ready to fight, or we're ready to lash back and we look at them and smile. That's not the response that I was looking for. But we remember what Peter said. Rejoice. Rejoice. So when we're facing these things, when we are in these places, uh, it's proving our faith uh, and others are seeing that. So when they see that we're going through and they see that we're rejoicing and praising God, uh, then they're going to want to know where we got that strength from. Uh, How are you ready to carry through that trial? How are you able to go through that? They know what they put on you. Uh, They know what they said to you. They know what they put you through on purpose. And then when it comes down to it, they're going to be more interested in becoming a Christian. Because you endured the suffering. It wasn't easy. Breakthrough sure enough was not easy, was it? Breakthrough was not easy at all. Revelations from God is not easy because God begins to reveal some things to us. In 2019, God revealed more to me about Jesus 
He revealed more to me about being like Jesus. I was praying, Lord, show me Jesus in every area of my life. But God also revealed some things to me that I didn't necessarily want to see. He revealed some things to me about me. Some shortcomings. When we say, God, I want revelation, we want to see the bang and the boom and the glory and the grace. But God begins to reveal some personality defects, if you will. But then He begins to reveal some things in different areas. And wow, now, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll want to get our head down. And God says, remember, you asked for revelation. And you ask for revelation because you want to be more like Jesus. So he said, don't hang your head, but lift up your eyes and rejoice. Because it's for a purpose. If we cave in under the pressure, we're going to be a poor witness for Jesus. If we go through the breakthrough, if we receive the revelation, if we get the restoration, we hold up under that pressure, we've got a great chance of reaching somebody else for the Lord. Maybe the very ones that's put us through the most. This could be the one that God's wanting us to reach. So be careful. Be careful. Even when you testify, be careful. Because maybe an unbeliever is there in the congregation. And they need to hear. They don't need to hear how bad you got it. You ever hear those kind of testimonies? I've pastored those kind of people. They kind of te- Okay, go ahead. The devil was on me all week long. I should have just wear a saddle because he wrote me. The devil got me here, and the devil did this, and the devil did that, and woe is me how bad I got it. Be careful when we testify. Be careful when we testify. We need to give all glory and honor to God to know that God is faithful as promised. He's not slack concerning His promises. He is faithful. Listen to some of the Scriptures that tells us of this. John 15 and 19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love His own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world hates you, church. If you don't want the world to hate you, you've got to become like them. It's a choice we have to make. We fit in with the world, we don't fit in with God. We fit in with God, we don't fit in with the world. The choice seems easy, doesn't it? If the world hates you, John 15, 18 and 22, he goes to say, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If I had not come and spoken unto them, uh, they had not had sin, uh, but now they have no cloak for their sin. Philippians 1 and 29, for unto you is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. 2 Timothy 3 and 12, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 1 John 3 and 13, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. You're going to face persecution. When you stand for God, the world's going to hate you. And I don't care if it's your mother, your brother, your sister, your spouse. If they're of the world, they're going to hate you when you stand for God. They're going to hate what you stand for, uh, but understand it's not you that they're hating. Uh, that They still love you, so to speak, in the flesh, uh, but they hate what you're standing for uh, and hate the fact uh, that you're not like them, that you're chosen a better way. Uh, so understand what he said. Uh, if they, they, they hate you, they hated me first, Jesus says. Uh, and then he says, persecution gives us a chance to rejoice. Peter said again, but rejoice. Now we understand that's hard to do. Nobody likes persecution. It hurts. It's hurtful. It's a hurtful thing when somebody says, I don't like you. It's a hurtful thing when somebody ignores you. It's a hurtful thing when somebody blocks you out of their life. It's a hurtful thing when people say hateful things to you. When all you've done is right. When all you did was stood for right. We don't understand. We don't understand. Mama told me something a long time ago. She said, son, consider the source. Consider 
the source. And you say, well, the source uh, is, is my family that I love. No, no, no. The source is the enemy who's the prince of the power of the air. Uh, if they're not on God's side, they're on his side. I know not one of us want to say uh, that our, our brother or our sister or our aunt or our uncle or our mom or our dad uh, or even the one that we share a bed with uh, is worshiping the devil. Uh, but if they're not worshiping God, uh, the devil collects it as worship. Uh, and so we, they may not be out there uh, offering human sacrifices and doing all the things uh, and dressed in black and golf uh, and doing all the things that demon worshipers and devil worshipers do. Uh, but if they're not walking with God, uh, listen, we tried to make a gray area of it uh, and say, I believe God. Uh, I, I, I love God. Uh, and I'm all of these things and have that gray area of Christianity. Uh, listen, it's either in or out. It's either black or white. He said they're either for us or they're against us. And if they're not walking with God, uh, if they're not walking with you in this grand old highway of holiness, uh, it does not matter uh, if you birthed them. Uh, it does not matter if you grew up with them. Uh, it does not matter if you said, I do at the end of the aisle with them. Uh, if they're not walking with you uh, on this grand highway, uh, the devil's going to use them uh, to bring persecution into your life. Uh, but listen, uh, love the sinner and hate the sin. Love them anyway. Be patient with them anyway. Endure the trial anyway. Uh, because that pressure and that, uh, that trial and that hatred that seems to be coming off of them towards you is actually being used against them by God. Because God is using your response to draw them in. Sometimes it's a slow process. Sometimes it's a long process. That's why it takes patience. That's why it takes endurance. That's why it takes a child of God to say, I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice? Here a few years ago, Brother Stone had this great idea. And I couldn't get the heart to tell him that Gideon's already take care of that, Brother Stone. But he had this great idea of he found Bibles for a dollar. King James Version Bibles for a dollar. I think at Dollar Tree. He said, I can get as many Bibles as we want, Brother Jamie, for a dollar. And he said, I want to, to, to start this, this thing at the church for a dollar for a Bible. And he said, I want to make a presentation. I said, go right ahead, Brother Stone. And he stood up. You may remember he stood up and he gave that presentation. Man, it was from the heart. And he said, how many of you have lost loved ones? And hands went up all over the house. Remember that? How many of you have lost loved ones? And hands went up everywhere. And Brother Stone said, how many would be willing to pay a dollar for that lost loved one to be saved? And, of course, hands went up everywhere. And Brother Stone said, you can buy a Bible for a dollar. And we're going to put it in the hands of those that do outreach to hand to a sinner. That's somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody that's lost. And we did that. We sent some to Brother Eddie Sullivan, who has a, a RV, home, uh, RV park ministry. We sent some to him, another man that had street ministry. We sent a lot of Bibles out. We raised a lot of money to do that, buy those dollar Bibles to put in the hands. But how many of us are willing to sacrifice? How many of us are willing to go through what you've had to go through if you know that the song is true, it'll be worth it after all, child. I'm telling you, whoever wrote that song, it's true. Romans 8, 18 is true. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. But hold on a minute. That's not just talking about heaven. Many years I preached that as just being the glory that's going to be revealed to us in heaven. God spoke to me one time. I read that verse. He said, son, that's talking about heaven, but you don't have to wait until heaven for my glory to be revealed in you. Can I tell somebody here tonight? I'm no prophet, never claimed to be, but I'm telling you what you've been through does not compare to the glory that God is going to reveal to you in 2020. If you receive that, reach your hand out right now and take hold of it in the name of Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I don't know what 2019 puts you through. I don't know what 2018. Uh, I've been here uh, six over six years. I don't know what you've got, gone through, but I've watched some of you go through some stuff. Uh, but I've watched a lot of you grow in that time frame. Uh, but I'm telling you, God is going to do some restoration. Uh, some rest I love uh, what Brother McDonald preached about restoration. Uh, we think, man, it's wasted years. Uh, I've heard people 
people talk about wasted years. Brother McDonald said, wait a minute. God said, I'll restore to you the years that those worms took. That means that God stored it up. That God placed it. You may have walked away from God and went away from God. And God said, you hadn't missed one blessing. God's saying, you don't have to make up anything to me. He said, I forgot about your sin when you knelt down at that altar and repented. I don't care if you was away from God one year, five years, ten years, twenty years. I knew a man that was away from God for over 50 years. 50 years. He told me, he said, Brother Jamie, when I was 25 years old, I was on fire for God. I was on fire for Him. Backslid, ended up in jail. He said, I was away from God for 50 years. When he came back to God, he was on fire for the Lord. He was on, Amy showed me a picture of him the other day. He's in his 80s now, still loving God, still serving God, still holding on. But what Brother McDonald said in that message is God has held that there in reserve. So don't think you've missed out on anything. Say, man, I've gone through some stuff. I'm missing out on some things. No, no, God's going to restore. I done lost my place. Peter said we should rejoice when it comes to these trials. Why? Because we're take, partaking of Christ's sufferings. He suffered. You know what he suffered? The just for the unjust. And so when they persecute us, we're suffering like Jesus did. And we are then identified with Christ. It wasn't his enemies that hung him on the cross. It was the religious crowd. It was the ones that talked about God. They counted him as a blasphemer. They counted him as one uh, that, that was making himself to be something that he was not. But yet, as a sheep that goes to its slaughter, he opened not his mouth. The Spirit and the glory of God rest upon us when we suffer. Some of the chief manuscripts of the New Testament translate this to say, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happier ye, for the spirit of glory and of power and of God resteth upon you. That word power is the word dunamis that we find in Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That word resteth there means more than it is upon you, but it goes deeper than that. It literally means to refresh, to give rest, or to make easy. So what Peter was really saying to us is when we suffer, the Holy Ghost helps us, and the Holy Ghost refreshes us and makes it easier for us. So if you've suffered, like I know many of you have, like I have, Understand that when we've suffered, we know that to be true. We know that to be true. Peter tells us, don't bring suffering upon yourself, though, in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Now, I shook that bush last Sunday night. I'll try not to shake it too much this evening. He said, you can bring suffering upon yourselves by your actions. Peter's saying we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't bring suffering upon ourselves. When we suffer, let it be because we love Jesus, not because we're breaking the law of God. Not because we've made ourselves an enemy of God. Not because we're doing wrong things, but because we're standing for right things. We have an obligation to obey the laws of the land as long as they don't force us to break the laws of God. And he gives, Peter gives us four examples here. He said we should not suffer as a murderer. We probably felt like killing somebody sometime or another in our lives. Don't do that don't do that he said we should not steal no matter how much we need something or how small it is we should never steal sister man was talking about that a little bit in the office about always having a conscience and never having a desire to steal and she told us a story about that she said before she got saved she told us that story uh, and that she just had no desire to steal and he said don't steal no matter how small it is uh, we got away for a few days with the kids this week and, and we were going through a food line there where we were at and as we was going through the food line they had a cup of grapes there and that line was long and I thought man I could just reach up there and just grab one of those grapes it would taste so good right now and it would be all right. Nobody would think anything of it. But then that conscience inside of me said, that ain't your grape. That ain't your grape today. So it, it, it's there. So no matter how small it is, he said, don't suffer. And don't go through it. You know, that would be a horrible feeling to eat that grape and then have to suffer for hours and for the rest of the day. And then have to go some, tell, tell somebody who's not going to get it and say, you lost your mind. Why are you even coming to me talking about this? Because you ate a grape. But you feel like you've got to make your wrongs right. So I'm glad I didn't do that. We should not do any kind of evil, but if we are to always do good, and we should not break the law. 
Then he said we're not to be busybodies, meddlers, troublemakers. Some folks love to do that, don't they? They always got to be in everybody else's business. They need to make sure the phone line's working, right? They got to find out the latest gossip. I had, I had a friend one time, his mother was just always just one of those, sweet lady, but she always wanted to know what was going on. What's new? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't watch the news. I, I don't keep up with what's new. What's going on? I have no clue. I have a hard enough time keeping up with myself, much less everybody else. I, I don't, if, if they wanted me to know, they would tell me. But some people just, they, they just got to know. So he said, don't do that. You're going to get yourself in trouble. Peter said, you should never do that. Don't be ashamed, though, to suffer for being a Christian. Verse 16, yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. We should never be ashamed if we suffer for being a Christian, but we should thank God for it. What did the apostles do in Acts chapter 5? We find them there. They were arrested for preaching Jesus. And they strictly forbid them. Told them, don't preach in his name anymore. Slapped them on the hand. Because they knew the outcry that would come if they did anything bigger. And they, so they slapped them on the hand and said, don't do that anymore. Don't preach in that name anymore. What do you think they did? Preachers of our day, you know what they would do? Zip it and clip it. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't saying nothing else. No, they kept on preaching. We find in verse 41 it says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. They came out of there with smiles on their faces. Did you see that? Giving each other a high five. Did you see how mad they got because we preached Jesus? One of them looked at the other and said, Let's do it again. Let's see how much trouble it gets us into this time, uh, lifting up the name of the Lord. Uh, so if you're going to suffer, uh, do it for the right reasons. Uh, so don't be ashamed. He said, if you'll be ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Uh, listen, we still have a right to preach the gospel. We still have a right to witness and testify. You can still stand on a street corner and hold up a sign that says, Honk if you love Jesus, if you want to. You can Right after all this impeachment stuff, I saw somebody up in Orange Park said, Honk if you support Trump. I don't know about Trump. I support Jesus, though. Trump ain't going to do nothing for me, but Jesus is. And so, some may not want to honk for Trump or honk for Biden or Obama or whoever in office. But they may honk for Jesus. Don't be ashamed. Don't quit. Don't stop doing good. Don't stop submitting yourself to God. Finally, in verse 9, he tells us, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. When we do this, when we suffer according to the will of God, there's two things that we need to do. I'm going to leave you with this, and then we're going to pray. Commit. The keeping of your souls to God, Peter says. And that word commit means to make a deposit. To give to for safe keeping. God said you either trust me or you don't. You can trust God. Make a deposit. As you're suffering, as you're going through these things, he's saying that we can know that God will keep us. God will keep our soul. He will restore our soul, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the psalmist said. And number two, keep doing well. Doing good is what got me into this problem. We'll keep doing it. Standing for rights, what caused me all this problem to start with. Do I keep doing right? Absolutely. This stand that I took has brought me all of these problems. Do I keep taking this stand? Yep. 100%. Stand for Jesus and let the world go by. Anybody remember that song? I'll stand for Jesus and let the world go by. No matter what happens, we have to keep doing well. We can't let persecution stop us from doing well. We can't let trouble stop, doing us, stop us from doing well. Later in... Romans 8, he said, none of these things 
not trouble, not famine, not nakedness, not peril, not sword. He names all of these things that will try to stop us. None of them can stop you. Keep doing well. Be sober. Be vigilant. You have an adversary. Keep marching on. We must keep doing good. We must keep working for the Lord. We must keep living this life. Don't be surprised, though, when suffering comes. Don't be surprised when you do right that everybody's not singing your praises. And everybody's not saying, wow, how wonderful they are. How wonderful they are. How great they are. When you keep the promises, President Trump kept all of his campaign promises, and you figure everybody's saying, what a guy. You know, they're saying, impeach the idiot. So just because you're standing for what is right, and just because you do what is right, does not mean everybody's going to stand with you. I'm thankful that we have a president that's standing for Christian values that stands against abortion. I'm thankful for that. And I stand with him. And, and I, I'm believing, I'm praying for him. And I prayed for Obama, and I prayed for Clinton, and I prayed for Bush, I, and I'll pray for every other president, Democrat or Republican, that'll be in my lifetime because that's what the Bible tells us to do. Uh, but I'm thankful for where we're at right now, uh, that we have a, 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 an office that's standing there and, and standing in place. We need to pray for him and lift him up uh, and, and understand something uh, that he can show us, that we can see by the example there just because you're doing what is right does not mean everybody's going to like you especially if they're of the world if they're not born again then what did you expect from them and if they say they're born again but you know they're a hypocrite what did you expect from them when they say they're a christian but there's no fruit what did you expect they're going to bring suffering your way. But you're not living this life for them anyway, are you? We're living for Him. And God is using you as the instrument to win them, I guarantee you. I guarantee you that God is dealing with them. They may not tell you to your face, but behind closed doors or in their mind, they're thinking, I want that kind of character. I want that kind of character and they can only find it when they kneel down at an altar and they're born again but it could it be that the only way that they ever make it to that altar is if you hold on if you hold on what do you do when you're suffering hold on keep being faithful keep being righteous keep being holy keep coming back to him letting him pour the oil on say man I took a smack this week let that shepherd call your name Call your name and bring you in and begin to inspect. It may, take every, it may be every Sunday morning that you have to come down to this altar and have the shepherd just inspect you and pour that oil in to bring that. It may be every service that you have to come and, and the suffering has been so much that you have to fall across that altar. It may be every day when you come into your prayer time, whether it's in the morning or the evening, that you just fall across that altar and you think, I can't handle much more of this. That The Lord begins to restore your soul and you go another day. Sometimes we go minute by minute. Sometimes we go hour by hour. Sometimes we go day by day. And sometimes we go from glory to glory. But we just keep holding on. It'll be worth it. After all, child, if I could sing, I would sing that. But I, I can sing a little bit, but I can't sing that song. It'll be worth it. After all of these trials, it's going to be worth it. If you believe that, stand to your feet tonight. So what are you going to do when you suffer? You going to complain? I'm suffering again. It's bad. It's really bad this time. Or are you going to rejoice like those disciples? Give me a high five, man. They just smacked me right upside my head because I said I believe in Jesus. Can you remember Paul and Silas? Sister Mary talked about that, that boa, that python spirit this morning. That python spirit followed them around. And Paul turned around and said, shut up. <laughs> of course, that's commentary according to me. But he turned around and told her, hush, stop it. And then those that really sent her came after them. Remember that? And they brought them and they put them in that inner prison. They beat the life out of them just about it stripes and they're bleeding and they're chained to the wall 
And they're in their prison, and they're, they're beaten, and they're bleeding, and they've just suffered for standing for Christ, for, for stopping a hypocrite from following them around and bringing a reproach to the ministry, doing what was right. Now they're nailed there. Scripture does not tell us that Paul looked at Silas and said, what do we get ourselves into? And Silas said, I didn't sign up for this. It got dark in that prison. It says, along about midnight. Long about midnight and the suffering, you can imagine. Have you ever had sweat getting an open wound? Man, it's burning. And they're sticking to that wall. And those chains are heavy. Sweat coming down their face and getting into those wounds. It's getting darker. It's already dark in the prison of that time, but now it's midnight and it's even darker. If any light was coming through, there was no light coming through be a miserable place to be in. I've never been in that kind of place physically. But Scripture tells us that long about midnight, they begin to sing and give praise to God. They begin to rejoice. I can't even imagine the songs that they begin to sing. But maybe Paul told Silas, man, they beat us hard, didn't they? If they could see each other, they could see smiles on their face. Well, we took a whooping. But it's all right. It's all right. I'll praise Him anyhow. How about you? Can you hear me, Silas? How about you? Yeah, Paul. He's still my God. Does it hurt? Yeah, it hurts. But that's all right. He said He'd never leave me or forsake me. He'd be with me always. Silas, do you understand why we're here? Not fully, but I'm not too worried about it. I'm just going to praise God. So they just got called up and praised, didn't they? They just began to pray and seek the face of God. And when they got their mind off their suffering and began to rejoice and began to magnify God, which we have a hard time doing when we're suffering, uh, but they begin to worship Him. You know what happened? Scripture says uh, that that whole prison shook, that their chains were loosed. They could have walked out of that prison. That guard was about to take his own life. And and Paul said, wait a minute, don't take your life. We're all here. Why did they suffer like that? Well, Scripture tells us that 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 guard uh, asked them, what must I do to be saved? Uh, And he brought them out, took them in, ministered to them. uh, And that night, uh, his household was saved. Uh, Are you willing to suffer uh, that another would be saved? Willing to go through what you got to go through in that midnight hour. So I could be complaining, but I choose not to. I choose to rejoice. Well, you have a choice to make tonight if you're suffering. What to do, what to do, right? If you're here tonight and you've been suffering or you are suffering, it's going to draw you closer to God or it's going to push you away from God. But God sent this message tonight to remind you that come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Notice in Psalms 23 that I preached this morning, he said he restoreth my soul. And he does it for his name's sake, leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Then he said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Listen, He's restoring you because you're going to have to go through some stuff. Are you ready? Are you ready to go all the way to see God's perfect will? As I pray, these altars are open to you tonight to say, Lord, I want to make the right choice and do the right things. So instead of complaining, I just want to come and rejoice. And thank you for the valley. Thank you for the hardships. Thank you for the struggles of 2019 because I know they're going to launch me into victory in 2020. I don't know everything you're going to do in 2020, but I know that you're up to something, God. And I know that you're up to restoration. That's all we know. And whatever that entails, I want it, God. I want it. I want it. Seek Him. Seek Him until you find Him. Pray until you pray through press until you press in get a hold of God tonight if you've suffered go ahead and thank him for that suffering because he's using it 
for his glory. Father God, as he's gathering this altar tonight, I pray, Lord, that you would just fill them with your power and your presence. Meet every need. Touch every heart. Everyone that is suffering and going through some stuff, I pray, God, that you'd bring it to full fruition. Lord, we don't say, pull me out. Lord, give me strength that your will may be fulfilled through it. You only reveal it to us in part, but we walk in that and trust you. We ask you right now to do it all in Jesus' name. Amen.